we're extremely pleased, and I'm in particular extremely pleased, to be welcoming um, a very old friend and colleague, uh, Hugh Kalis, who is currently a senior digital humanities developer at Duke Library um, and works um, in an institution called DC3, so the Duke Classics Computing Collaboratory. I probably got those words in the wrong order. They're in the wrong order, but yeah. they're the right words. They're the right words, okay, that's what's important. Um, and it's going to be speaking to us today about a project that has in one way or another been several years um, in the making, um, but the last few last couple of years of its making have um, been done so um, largely in behind, you know, out of my sight as it were. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about this as much as, uh, as much as any of you are. So you'll be talking about the Integrating Digital Epigraphies uh, project, EYES. Um, Hugh, thank you very Great. much. Thanks. Yeah, so... Um, I am working on this project called um, Integrating Digital Epigraphies, or IDES, um, and it aims to be a basically a linked data platform for epigraphy. Um, I should start out um, by saying a couple things. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a real epigraphist, um, so um, I'm really mostly these days a programmer with a background in classics. Um, so I may occasionally say something that's you know, obscure in one way or another, or just stupid, um, for which, forgive me. Um, I also flew in just this morning. Um, so I'm extremely tired and jet lagged, and I may at times appear to be slightly drunk. I promise I'm not. So I'm part of this group working out of the Duke University Library called DC3, um, or Duke collaboratory for classics computing, which is the words in the right order, um, which has been generously supported in its startup phase by the Mellon Foundation. So I would like to start by thanking them very much. So in this project IDES, we are partnering with um, SEG, the Supplementum Epigraphicum Graecum, um, the Packard Humanities Institute um, Greek Epigraphy project, um, the Claros project, and uh, JSTOR. I'll talk a bit more about those, um, most of those later. Let's see if Gabby's special slide clicker works. Yes, it does. So to give you a bit of background, um, this epigraphy project um, was in large part inspired and comes out of a previous um, project called um, integrating digital papyrologies. You can see we like integrating digital things. Um, and it built, this, um, it built this web service called papyri.info. And I was part of the team that spent several years building this system, uh, basically for doing papyrology online. Um, and I want to talk about it a little bit to help set the stage for talking about IDES. The goal of papyri.info was initially to combine the data from four projects, uh, which you see listed here. The Duke Databank of Documentary Papyri, um, the Heidelberger Gesamt for Psychness. I won't attempt to say the whole thing because I'm sleep deprived and will butcher it, uh, but HGV for short. Um, the Advanced Papyrological Information System, or APIS, um, and uh, Trismegistos. So these, these were kind of some of the um, major digital projects in the field of papyrology. Um, and they all did, they all took um, sort of different slices of the discipline. The Duke Databank republished editions of papyri. Um, HGV holds data about the papyri and about their editions. Um, and APIS contained basically catalog records from institutions with papyri holdings. Uh, Trismegistos is kind of the glue that puts them all together um, it maintains unique identifiers for documents on papyrus, and they contribute metadata of their own as well. So, papyrology's digital landscape was already pretty well organized. It was divided into essentially these, these kind of vertical silos rather than being splintered all over the place. And the work we did in the Integrating Digital Papyrology project um, essentially cross-linked and aggregated records from these partners and allowed them then to be edited and updated online using a peer-reviewed workflow. So we were able to 
given a particular papyrus document, we were able to pull together all of the data um, about that document and put it together in one single view. And you'll, you'll see an example of that um, a little bit later. So that's digital papyrology. Um, that site has been running now for a few years. It's, it's still going very well, except you may have noticed today it's, it's been unavailable um, because uh, there was some sort, of, some sort of network problem happened while I was over the Atlantic, um, as these things do. And, um, and my colleague, Ryan Bauman, is, is fighting with Duke OIT to uh, try and diagnose the problem. Um, so we should all think nice thoughts about Ryan. So given that, um, I want to talk then about digital epigraphy, which has a very different landscape. Um, the, both the digital and analog um, landscape of epigraphy is, is pretty fragmented. Um, in size, it's an order of magnitude larger than papyrology's collection of texts. Um, there's probably half a million inscriptions um, in uh, Greek alone, um, more in Latin. Um, of those in Greek, um, 300,000 or so have been published, um, often in multiple venues. Um, on the analog side, we have various corpora that publish inscriptions, usually organized by location or theme. We have journals in which inscriptions are published. We have things like SEG, um, which is both print and online, um, which collects bibliography summaries um, and sometimes publishes editions themselves or republishes them. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about Greek epigraphy here for reasons I will discuss later. So inscriptions are, like papyri, are published and republished, um, but even more so. And they're, they're published and republished to an extent that it can prove actually a bit of a minefield for a non-epigraphist to be certain that they're not actually talking about uh, multiple publications of the same stone. Uh, this mistake has been made um, more than once, and by very reputable people. Um, they just weren't epigraphists. The digital landscape in epigraphy is a bit less fragmented. Um, Latin epigraphy does have several online databases that contain text and metadata. Um, these are organized along regional and or thematic lines, so we don't have the neat partitioning that we had um, in papyrology, um, at least in, on the Latin side. But many of these have been undertaking a major coordination um, under effort under the auspices of EGLE, um, leading to their data being aggregated in the Europeana database. Um, and incidentally, this is why um, we've been focusing on Greek epigraphy, because this EGLE initiative has been going on, um, and they're doing a lot of the work that we would otherwise have had to. Um, and what we're sort of hoping is that at the end of that, we'll just be able to hoover up all their nice data um, and, and use it, and you know, we won't have to do a whole lot of extra work. That would be the ideal. So on the Greek side, we do have some of the same sorts of partitioning. We have a lot of the texts, actual texts available online and searchable in the um, PHI Greek Epigraphy Project. Um, we have SEG online as well under the auspices of Brill. So it's a commercial operation. Um, and the data isn't freely available. You, your institution has to have a subscription. Um, and to help navigate the bibliographic landscape, we have the um, CLAROS project, which comes out of the Diccionario, Diccionario Griego Español. Um, so they um, essentially want to make sure they're not making the mistake of citing, um, wrongly citing um, inscriptions, and so they've, they've traced um, the um, chain of citations um, by hoovering up um, lots and lots of indices. So they have 1.5 million pairs of citations um, taken from the indices of other epigraphic publications. Um, these, are just, these are just pairs for publication X, C, publication Y. 
PHI takes the text of epigraphic editions, um, minus commentary and apparatus, and presents them digitally. So this means that for all its usefulness, it isn't very good about flagging cases where a new edition updates an existing one. Um, so to give you an example, um, that's papari.info, by the way, which we'll come back to. So IG I cubed 232, um, there is an SEG record which suggests that for this inscription in line 43, um, instead of, instead of basileocene, um, philobasileus um, should be um, supplied. <coughs> Thus, philobasileocene, um, and they just republish the line um, they don't republish the whole inscription. Um, you can see that, that they, do, they do have a citation um, to the original. Oops, and I managed to click and turn off the... So they, they, do, they do cite the original, but um, the original doesn't know at all about um, what's been done to it um, were suggested about it later. Um, so, you know, PHI does cite the original, but it doesn't, the original doesn't link back to it, and the change doesn't actually link back um, in a machine actionable way to the original. So, what this means is it's not actually safe just to search PHI and do things with the result. Um, you have to bring all your epigraphical knowledge with you in order to make best use of what's there. Um, Claros, by contrast, does actually maintain um, links kind of like this, um, though again, they're just, um, they're just pairs. Um, they're just pairs of citations. So Claros would know um, that um, there's this pairing between IGI 3232 and uh, SEG 3917. But Claris's pairing has no metadata or semantics attached to it. Um, so we don't know, for example, whether publication B is a republication of publication A, or whether it simply cites it for some reason. Um, both of those things happen. SEG is the best of the lot in many ways. It does link between its articles, um, and some of those do publish editions, and it does signal, um, albeit only in the way that it formats its citations, the, the kind of aboutness of an article. So whether um, the placement of the citation um, in the SEG article indicates whether this article is principally about that inscription or whether it, if it actually is publishing um, an inscription, whether it's a republication of some sort. So, what we've got is in the transition from print to digital, um, we've gained uh, huge improvements in searchability um, so we can get to data that we might be interested in much, much faster um, than we used to be able to. But there hasn't been much improvement in the intelligence of that data. So moving on then to IDES. Um, Unlike the case with papari.info, we don't have partners who are willing to just give us their data um, and then either cease doing business separately um, or to take a back seat to the new project. So APIS, for example, no longer has a separate existence from papari.info. Um, the Duke Data Bank, probably not surprisingly, um, since it was a Duke project, also no longer has a separate existence. Um, HGV does, but papari.info is really the place where you normally principally engage with HGV data. Um, HGV 
tracks a little bit ahead in terms of editing uh, of papyri.info, but that's where you usually go. But in IDES, for various good reasons, um, our partners want to retain their data um, and the right to display it. So IDES isn't going to take over from PHI displaying um, and making searchable inscriptions. It isn't going to take over from SEG. Um, it isn't going to take over even from Claros. They ha our partners have, however, very generously shared their data with us um, so that we can develop services that we hope will enable them to integrate with each other more effectively. So a little aside, in a talk about digital epigraphy, epigraphy you might expect me to um, be discussing EpiDoc. Um, tremendous work has been done on the mechanics of publishing editions of inscriptions, uh, much of it by people in this room, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, you might expect me to talk about doing a project along the lines of papyri.info. Um, so the kind of thing the Eagle Project has been doing for aggregating Latin inscriptions into Europeana. But I'm not going to do that either. PHI has a handle on the publication of Greek inscriptions. Um, it would be kind of silly to try and duplicate what they're doing. Um, it would also be silly to expect um, our partners like SEG and JSTOR to completely change their business models and turn the publishing of their data over to us. That's not going to happen. So IDES is not going to be a data aggregator in the style of Europeana or the DPLA or papyri.info for that matter. We want to be a data aggregator more in the style of Google, uh, modulo the part about bombarding you with ads. Um, that is, we want to be a service that aggregates data for the purpose of making the other digital epigraphy projects work better together. Um, you don't tend to spend a lot of time on Google, um, unless, it's actually, unless it's not working. Um, <laughs> you do a search, um, possibly without even going to the website first, um, then you click through to the thing you want, and you're gone. We want IDES to work in similar ways. Um, we do have a user interface, um, but we see it's that interface's ultimate use as being to help humans um, debug our data for us. Um, it's the human readable interface is there so that you can see where we've failed um, and tell us how to fix it. So imagine, well, our main focus is going to be actually our APIs, our machine readable interfaces, um, which will offer epigraphy focused projects ways to discover and link to related material on other sites. So imagine PHI users, for example, being able to see uh, bibliography and republications of the inscription they're reading um, and being able to just click a link to get them. Um, or imagine reading an article in JSTOR and being able to click through to the full text of a mentioned inscription um, in PHI. That's the kind of thing we want to enable. Um, so not to take over but just to make everything else work better. So the question then is, is how do we get there? Um, and how far have we gotten? And I'm going to talk about a bit about things that, that made me cry. <laughs> Part of what we need to do is to, be able to, is to write a chunk of code that can parse a short form epigraphic citation. So all the epigraphists will know instantly what this is. Um, right, this is Inscriptiones Graecae, um, volume one, the third edition, item 40. Um, we need to be able to parse this into chunks um, so that we can use it to match against its fellows. Um, so this is how PHI writes um, IG I340, but Claros does it a little bit differently, for example. So how, how do we tell that IG I cubed 40 um, is the same thing as IG I square bracket 3 period 40? Right? These are 
these are both perfectly comprehensible citations to a human being, or at least an epigraphist, um, but not, um, not necessarily to a machine. So one approach might be um, to build an artificial intelligence, teach it Greek epigraphy, and, and hope it doesn't respond by sending Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger back in time to murder your parents. Um, or we could try splitting it into, splitting the strings into chunks, um, normalizing them, and then comparing them. So we want a machine we can feed um, this citation into and get back something like this table, right? So we want to be able to get out of that the series title, the volume name, the item number in separate boxes. Um, then all we need to do is convert the volume and item number numbers into um, something that's actually comparable and turn them into real numbers. Um, so I cubed becomes 1.3. And ideally, when I feed the Claros version of the citation into the same machine, um, I get back basically the same response. Right? This means I can successfully compare the two and decide that they're equal, even though the form of the citation is slightly different. So if we look at these two, we can guess that the pattern is something like title, volume, item, um, separated by spaces or punctuation. Um, so we can, we can split the string up, we can tokenize it, um, and then just apportion each element into one of these, those three boxes. Um, some publications don't have multiple volumes. They're single volume, that's fine. We just leave the volume box empty and we just have the title and the item number. Um, so that's great. Um, but this pattern doesn't always hold. Um, so if you think about um, the inscriptions of Crete, um, their form is something like, um, and again, this is phi, um, SEG, and Claros, um, citing the same thing in slightly different ways. Um, and they have ICIX1 um, or similar. So here we've got the title, the volume, then the section within the volume, that's what the X is, and then the item. So we really want to put them in a box like this, right? Um, so instead of what you might imagine um, the volume containing, I, the volume being IX, um, the volume is just I and the item is X1. Um, or 10.1 when we've normalized it. So we can compare a um, slightly different citation, um, IG10, um, this is part two, fascicle one, um, item one. Um, and yeah, so we've got a sort of vaguely similar looking um, citation in form, but we need to do different things with it. Um, in this case, the extra stuff goes in the volume and the item is just the last, the last thing in the string. Um, so, you know, I've been writing, I've been working on this parser. Um, and a machine, um, particularly a machine that doesn't know epigraphy, um, because, you know, we don't want the terminator, um, operating in a naive way would, would split it up um, and, you know, would attempt to apportion the, the um, five, in this case, um, elements that it would get. Um, and it would probably get it wrong. Um, or if it got this right, it would get the Inscriptiones Creticae one wrong um, because it doesn't know. Um, it doesn't know which, um, which way to turn. So you might note that, um, I don't know if you can see this or not, this is, this is from SEG, um, and don't really worry about it. The, this is how SEG um, 
tokenizes um, its citations. It does split up its citations, um, which is nice in its data, um, but it doesn't actually give you very much help. It portions the citation parts into what's essentially a sparse eight element array um, represented as level um, one through eight attributes in its XML. Um, and while it's, it's consistent in terms of series, um, so IG will always use the same slots and like position three, for example, is reserved for addition numbers. Um, they're not comparable across series though. Um, they do completely different things um, as you can see between iCRET and IG. Um, so yeah, it's, it's enough to make you cry or think bad thoughts. Um, what this means, of course, is that although there are general rules you can follow, um, you know, the last thing in one of these citations that looks like a number is probably an item number. Um, each corpus, or possibly even volume, has its own internal logic. Um, and you know, we can wish that they had um, standardized and um, given nice, unique identifiers to all their inscriptions, um, but they didn't. There was really no need to in print. Um, they were unique enough, and they were citable, and that was fine. Um, we didn't need to know how it actually worked. So, yeah, writing a parser that correctly handles all of the citations from PHI, SEG, and Claros is, is a tall order. Um, and I can't claim yet to have done it, um, though I have made a fair amount of progress. Um, you might... Um, as an aside, ask why I'm not taking a machine learning approach to this. Um, and I have a couple of answers to that question. The first is that machine learning approaches are, are pretty opaque. You don't actually know what's happening inside the box when you're parsing stuff. And so it can be quite hard to debug um, if it's doing the wrong thing. Um, the, I'm honestly much more comfortable knowing exactly what's going on. Uh, inside the box and being able to adjust the internals of the parser. The other reason is that um, ML approaches require a training set. Um, and so we'd have to go through rounds of producing pre-parsed examples. Um, basically, we'd have to do a whole bunch of the work ourselves anyway um, in order to tell the machine learning algorithm how to do its job. So I think that once we have good parses of 90% of our material, um, machine learning approaches may be actually very useful um, for, for example, recognizing new citations in the wild, like searching for them in JSTOR. Um, but that's for later. So, yeah, this is, you're all asleep. Um, it's okay, I know. Um, to sum up a little bit, um, this part anyway, what we're dealing with is a fairly straightforward port of what we did in print culture um, into the digital space. Claros just has index entries. SCG tokenizes its citations, but it doesn't categorize them. PHI citations are just strings. Um, I certainly don't mean to criticize any of these projects. They made the decisions they felt ha they had to based on the job they were doing. Um, but I think we can do better. Digital Humanities has, in recent years, focused a lot on issues around distant reading, um, trying to understand corpora as a whole, to see what patterns can be drawn out via visualization and by processing large amounts of data in various ways. Um, that's obviously a naive and distant view of DH, um, though it is certainly one way digital methods can make a contribution. But I'm from a different school. Um, most of my work, even here, where I'm crunching through lots of citations, is about making the data more precise and more detailed, zooming in rather than zooming out. Print culture relies on context and human expertise to convey its knowledge. You have to be or to become an expert in order to use epigraphic resources. In the digital realm, we can take some of that expertise and apply it directly to the representation of the information. It's a data modeling problem. And incidentally, this is where projects like Epidoc do nudge their way back into the conversation. Because what we did with Epidoc, representing the typographic language of the Leiden Conventions in semantic XML, is similar to the kind of thing IDES is trying to do with epigraphic bibliography, 
We're trying to add enough intelligence to the citation that you can understand it and its context by following its web of relationships, rather than by having to bring the understanding and context with you. So the state of play is this then. We have a big pile of citations and editions. The editions are transcriptions of documents, and the citations pointed editions, which are usually part of corpora, and we have articles about editions and documents. We also, incidentally, have some images of the stones um, and geographic information about the whereabouts and provenance of the stones, and a batch of articles likely to contain lots of citations of inscriptions. We have a somewhat reliable way to parse citations so that we can get volume and series information out of them and so that we can compare them to each other. We have multiple citations of the same edition and editions that update or cite other editions. Um, this sounds like some sort of network graph. Um, so my first thought was, um, I know, we should use RDF. Um, We'd actually had a good deal of success using an RDF database as the power behind um, papyri.info. It's, it's the glue that puts together um, items from different collections. Um, so it, this actually wasn't much of a jump. But thing is, in papyri.info, we owned all of the data. And it turns out that it's a problem when you don't. You can think of RDF databases as collections of facts. Um, in the form of triples. So a triple has a subject, a predicate, and an object. Um, optionally, you can add a fourth item, a context, or a graph, as it's called. So in papyri.info, um, and incidentally, this is probably better represented by the papyri.info page. Um, in papyri.info, um, we had a whole bunch of facts. Um, such as that the Duke Data Bank ID O Baron IK 11 um, is the same as the is talking about the same thing as the Tris Megastos ID um, seven zero seven seven eight, um, and the fact that all these things are talking about the same thing is um, is is a fact um, that we know, um, and you know we're happy we're happy about knowing that. We don't really care how we know that this Duke um, ID is related to an HGV ID. We just know it, and that's OK. Um, because everything is part of a single system, um, we can just happily say that what we think is true is true. It's fine. But the boundaries of IDs aren't so well circumscribed. Um, our data comes from a variety of partners who will maintain control of it. Um, so it's not our data, it's their data. Um, and we've seen what the state of it is. Um, from Claros, we get the mere fact of citation with no indication of what type of citation that is. Um, we get a bit more from SEG, but even there it could be more detailed. Um, the situation is even is much the same when we look at place information. The location attached to an edition could be the stone's fine spot. Um, it could be its current location. Um, it could even be the place where the document, not the stone, but the document originated. So we can make some guesses and inferences that improve um, upon this vagueness, but in order to really get a handle on it, we'll have to open the data set up to experts who are willing to make corrections. Um, again, in papyri.info, corrections happen in a very controlled way um, so that we can still be happy about our facts. Um, but in IDES, what we really have are a set of assertions. Um, so, for example, someone might come along and assert that the relationship between these two editions is one of updating rather than one of citing. Um, it means that the provenance of our assertions, of our facts, um, becomes very important. We'll need to know how we know our facts. Um, and it turns out this is something RDF isn't actually very good at. Um, it's, it's axiomatic that any information at all can be represented using triples. Um, but while this is true, it comes with a cost. And that cost is that you have to reify anything that you want to talk about. Um, so, for example, 
um, you can imagine an assertion like this. Inscription A has location Athens, right? We have that kind of thing um, in our data now. But if we want to know how we know that, we have to be able to point at the assertion itself. And so it has to have its own, the assertion itself has to have its own identifying URI. So we have to, instead of something simple like this, we have to do something like this. Um, right? We have to say that this thing is a location assertion and this thing concerns inscription A and this thing asserts that the location is Athens and this was asserted by me. Um, so we can model this, right? But it starts to get painful. Um, and it makes querying it painful. And it means that working with the data is awkward. And you have to do this sort of thing any time you want to comment on an assertion to indicate its provenance, to qualify it in any way. Um, it would be much simpler if we had some way of saying things about um, triples directly, but RDF and RDF databases don't give us those kinds of affordances. Um, so what are you going to do? Well, the approach we're taking with IDES, and this is a bit of an experiment, um, is to keep the semantics of RDF, but to use a different data store behind it, one which gives us some of the affordances that we need. For now, we've settled on a property graph database called Neo4j. Um, a property graph is a thing that's perfectly capable of representing triples. It has nodes and relations between those nodes. Um, those relations can be directed just like they are in RDF, so they, they have a direction. They point from one node to the other. Um, the difference is that nodes in a property graph have a separate existence. Um, so URIs in a triple store only exist, only exist if they're part of a triple. Right? URIs in a property graph can exist all by themselves. So as a very simple example, um, our identifier nodes are in, in this kind of form. Um, so id seg ig i.3-40 um, has an identifier ig i.340, which is SEG's way of talking about it. Um, we've seen that if we want to be able to enable comparison um, and things like matching and sorting, um, we need to be able to add additional metadata to go back. We need to be able to add additional metadata to this thing, right? We need to add our parse data to it. Um, and in a property graph in Neo4j, we can do this. All of the nodes and relations in a Neo4j database get unique IDs, so we have a handle for any of them. Um, and we can say things about them either directly by just attaching properties to them. So I can say for this thing, the title is IG, the volume is 1.3, and the item is 40 um, in real numbers. And therefore, it's comparable directly to something else, um, to another citation in a slightly different form. So we're hopeful that we can use this as a way of getting around some of the shortcomings of RDF. So to sum up a bit and see how much of your time I've abused. Good, I'm coming up on 40. Um, and pull back to a higher level. The data in epigraphy, as it is elsewhere in the humanities, is messy, contingent stuff. Um, we don't so much have collections of facts as assemblages of facts, assertions, guesses, inferences, um, data really probably isn't actually a good name for it, though I can't honestly think of a better one. Um, we depend on knowing what our data means in its context. And historically, we've relied on scholars bringing a lot of that contextual knowledge to the table with them. If we want to be able to fulfill the promise of greater accessibility and ease of use that digital methods hold out to us, though, we're going to have to do a great deal of work to embed that contextual intelligence into our data. And if we're going to do that, we'd better be sure we're using the right tools to do it. Um, so that's most of my presentation. Um, I wanted to see back and um, show you a bit of 
Ides, which is up in its nascent terrible, and I emphasize the terrible form, all of our mistakes are out there. Um, all of my parser's mistakes are out there for the world to see. Um, but again, the interface is there so that um, we can see what those mistakes are. Um, it's at ides.io, so it's got one of those cool new um, uh, IO um, suffixes um, because ides.com and everything else was taken. Um, and the idea is that, for example, if you wanted to search for um, phi um, number ID number 40, um, or Claros IGI340, um, you'd be able to plug that, um, you can now, in fact, plug that identifier in, um, and you get back um, an ID for the inscription itself um, um, that we get from phi. Um, it's got a link to, <clears throat> it's got a link to the phi um, text, come up eventually. There it is. Um, if there was an SEG um, text named this, there would be a link to that as well. Um, and it tells us um, meta information about it. It tells us what this, um, what this cites according to Claros and SEG, um, what SEG articles it's a topic of, um, and what it's cited by. Um, and if it cited things, sorry, if it cited things, it would tell you what it cited as well. So we can go and look at one of the SEGs, for example. So here we get the link to um, SEG directly. We get um, what its topic is, which is the inscription we were just looking at. Um, we get what it cites and what it's cited by, which is all SEG stuff. Um, the idea is that for each of these pages, there would also be machine-readable pages um, in both RDF and other formats that SEG could hit, for example, and link directly to the PHI um, inscription um, as part just within their own regular interface. PHI could link directly to the um, SEG articles that discuss it. Um, if when we have um, citations from JSTOR, it could link to, and we haven't we haven't trolled through all the, through all the JSTOR data yet, um, so that's not available yet. When we have it though, PHI will be able to use its own identifier to look up what other essentially what other projects know about. Um, the inscription that it's talking about. Um, and we'll have widgets that all these different projects can embed and um, link dynamically from their own material to other people's materials. Um, we'll also have uh, links to um, images on Flickr where they're available um, and um, whatever other good stuff we can come up with, translations from the Attic Inscriptions Online project will be another thing that comes on board hopefully soon. Um, so like I said, I, when I first proposed this talk, I assumed, as one does, that I would be much further along with this than I am. Um, but you know, things happened. Um, I got derailed working on um, the 2.0 upgrade for the Papyrological Editor, um, you know, which is finally almost ready. And you know, we have this, which is, I invite you to look at. It will change week to week, um, hopefully for the better. Um, it will have all kinds of horrible stuff um, to begin with, and will do things wrong and make you angry. But that's good, because um, the other part of this that we hope to add is an editing interface. So when you see something that makes you angry, you can fix it. Um, you can tell us, no, this is not, um, you've, you've parsed inscriptiones criticae citations completely wrong, um, and you need to go and fix it, um, and here's how. So the idea is that we'll engage um, the anger and rage of the world's Greek epigraphists to 
make our site better. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, that's about all I have. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, that was um, especially this this demo here extremely courageous to throw up, full of errors, as you say. Um, but yeah. that's uh, as you say, that's why you uh, why you did it that way. Mm. Um, that's great. Yes. Are there any any questions or comments or whatever on that? Yes. Yeah. Now, apart from you get inscriptions like get reliefs, where part of it's in one museum and part is in another museum, and then site came from. So, are we going to get in this um, emporium, if you like? The notifications say where part of it is, part of it is, you know, so you can you know, link them together. And can you digitally link them so you can actually put the two or three bits together? The, the answer is them. yeah. It's it's certainly possible to digitally link them. It depends what we have from. In in the first instance, it's going to depend on what we have from our sources, um, which may or may not give us useful and in place information. Most likely, given um, what we see now, um, there will be place information, but it won't, um, it won't be characterized. So there'll just be three, you know, if it's in three different, if it's in two different places um, and comes from a third place, we might just get all three places if we're lucky uh, as, you know, location. Um, this is where we really need, um, where we'll really need the community's help um, so they can say, well, it, you know, this part is in Athens, but um, it began its life um, over here, and this other part is in this museum in Berlin, right? Um, that kind of, of characterization is what the sources lack. Yeah, that's what I'm asking us for. This is where the digital technology is a great advantage. Yeah. You can actually put things together, yes. which you can't do on the ground. Yeah. And it really makes the study of it so much more yeah. enriched. The idea is, is definitely to enable that, yeah. that kind of thing, yes. Thank you. The trouble is that sort of merging will probably have been done invisibly in the source. The database that, will say this is what text yeah. and it won't say. So you won't have a record for this fragment in Berlin and a record for this fragment in North Carolina yes. um, that, that we can then magically bring together. They will probably be invisibly brought together anyway. And that, that is often the case. Them. So the yeah the the issue then will not be putting it together, but um, adding and characterizing the right location information. So you know, you know if you want to actually go and see the thing, um, you have to go here and here. Yeah. I was wondering whether, in some ways, at this stage, location is a bit of a red herring in mm -hmm. terms of relationships because it's a different order of relationship. Yeah. From the rest that you're talking about. And the rest, the others you're talking about are quite tough enough, mm. um, because I was wondering what an inscription is. Yeah. This is. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, this well, is one's been here before. <laughs> <laughs> because here, presumably, an inscription is as defined in the particular publication. Yes. So we're we're really dealing here not with inscriptions but with additions. Yes. Um, Which is and then why I thought location is pro as a problematical possibly ultimate. It is, but again this is the idea is to is to put everything we're we're making up um, an identifier for the inscription as a hub that we can join things around. Mm. Um, and mm. yeah. very often indeed most of the time we won't know um, at the beginning that um, edition A and edition B are actually talking about the same inscription. So we will have assigned different IDs um, for the thing that those editions are talking about. And one of the things we'd want to enable is the merging of those two, uh, of those two identifiers. That's a particular problem with PHI, you've got masses of duplicates. Yes, yes they do. This is what we have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the relationship then with your merged identifications as you've got them and the permanent metal, the number, and Chris Magistos, which has been setting out to start to do the same thing? For a yes. Ideally, if, if they had already done it, we'd be using TMIDs. Um, and as TMIDs come online, um, 
for these things, we will add them as well. Um, we, we, we couldn't wait um, is, is the real answer. Um, so, you know, we're, we're buddies with, with Tris McGistos and Mark DePauw, and, and we want to work with them. But we also, we have to do something, um, even if it's something temporary, um, to issue an identifier to the inscription itself. We you at an early stage indicate to people how they should be expressing their citations? If I publish a new inscription on I would like tomorrow, to be able to do that. I think that's something I'd really like to see yeah. on your front page really soon. So that from yeah. so the future, given that this is a moving science and more stuff is coming out all the mm. time. We have, we have talked about doing that a little bit. Um, in, in sort of the fashion that um, the, get rid of that so you can see it, um, in sort of the fashion that um, the Duke Data Bank does. So it, it has this idea of title, volume, item as well, and it delineates them with semicolons. Um, so, you know, we might do, we might actually um, issue that sort of recommendation. And when you, when you search, um, and you would, this is another thing, you'll be able to search by, you'll be able to plug in a citation um, and have it search and try to match your citation up. And it will tell you how it's splitting that up and you'll be able to see if it's getting it wrong. And will tell you, well, if you'd done it this way, we would have gotten it right. Um, so yeah, we, we'd like to be able to um, steer the epigraphic community towards um, um, repeatable and um, comprehensible citation. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, people have, of course, complained about about with many corpora is because they concentrate upon Greek and Latin, mm. that other languages are often excluded. Yeah. And you can get an inscription, or at least an inscribed object, where one language text is published in one corpus mm. and another one in another. And I know the sure. new corpus for Judea and Palestine is actually now going against that. Mm -hmm. um, but in theory, this would be truly useful yeah. if these other languages where they happen to coincide were brought in so yes. the connections are finally being made without everything having to be republished in new corpora. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Again, we're working with you know, we're working with the resources that we have um, as a beginning, but yeah, there's there's no reason to be, um, I don't want to say silly, but th there's no reason to be parochial about language. Um, we should absolutely be including um, Hebrew and Arabic and other languages um, in this. Yes, Trismegistos are, are good about um, are good about that. I have a very boring question about the mm. parsing. It's okay. Mo most of this was very boring. Yeah, so, <laughs> but so I, I, I don't know if anyone wanted to jump in with a more interesting question. <laughs> <or> <laughs> no, I about parsing as well. So you go mm. first. Okay. Like question um, on parsing may be different. I wondered the um, so you were talking about the difficulty of splitting these references into three parts and mm -hmm. getting the bits of those parts in the right yeah. place. Um, and so I've got two sort of unrelated questions. The first, the first is, do, does it matter if the partisan knows how many parts there are? Does it, does it matter that there are three rather than four or five parts? And does it matter if the partisan knows which part is which? As long as it splits it into X number of parts, N number of parts, and it splits another version of the same citation to n number of parts, and they match. So I'm thinking, I mean, so T T L G um, has you know anything between two and nine levels um, of, identi of of you know of parts yeah. in each identifier, and it they don't they don't attach any semantics to it at all because it doesn't really matter as long as they match numerically. Um, you would be right if um, all epigraphic publications were cited. Um, in the same way, the same number and, of parts, and they're not. Um, there are there are differences. Yeah. Um, if, if I were less jet lagged, I'd be able to uh, summon one up yeah. immediately. But there there are examples where, um, you know, for 
for the purposes of one um, PHI treats something that has actually has a volume number like yes. um, a single edition yeah. and um, other projects yeah. don't. And so you can't count on, um, yeah. you can't count on different citations actually having the same number of yeah. parts. Yeah. I mean, there's already the difficulty of, of being able to parse I cubed as being the same thing as one space three. Mm -hmm. um, one space three is clearly two parts and I cubed kind yeah. of looks like one part. It does. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, it's that difficult. And so on, on the question of, um, of machine learning, mm. um, I wondered if, you, um, if you'd looked at the work that Matteo Romanello has done on, yes. on this in um, at the Dutch Archaeological Institute for his PhD, because I know he's, I mean, he's working with JSTOR data, yeah. and he has had a certain amount of Yes. Yeah. No. It, he's he's been at it. Yeah. He's been at it longer and has yeah, yeah, um, yeah. lots of good examples. And yeah. um, I want to get to the stage where I have lots well, have of good examples. examples. To work with, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Like so, I like I said, I, I think it I think it will definitely have a role, mm -hmm. and um, likely particularly for trying to identify um, epigraphic citations in journal articles yeah. in JSTOR. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so exactly the same kinds of things that Matteo is doing. He's been doing. You got a different parsing question. Different parsing, Good. But, but, uh, thank you for bringing up my tag, if you say so, we do that as well. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for the talk, you fascinating. Huh? I love a talk about bigotry where the speaker starts at the very beginning and says, I love the bigotry. <laughs> because then I know, well, I'll get it, because neither do <laughs> I. Um, but when you, when you finish, you were talking I, about. I wouldn't want to claim to be an epigraphist because I would, I would quickly be exposed as a charlatan. Yeah, someone yeah. might ask you complicated questions exactly. about an API, and I understand yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> but the, you finished up with saying about you know, competing with the errors, and you mentioned the parsing on there. Mm. And as I say, you won't be annoying me with any errors in there because I mm. don't know if they're an error or not. You're not an epigraphist. <laughs> but you're going to engage the community, yeah. and when they find. Uh, Yeah. So, with the with the correction, with the correction of the parsing, is are the corrections on an individual one-off, one by one basis, or <coughs> um, I, I think Gary was hinting at with the machine learning, will the parsing grow, and will it will it somehow by magic fix the other ones that are similarly incorrect? Um, it, it's not? it's already not on a one by one basis. It's usually a matter of, you know, it's, it's like the, um, the iCret um, one where just this particular series has their own weird way um, of um, organizing uh, themselves and in, in, in citations. So you have to tell it, you know, if you see iCret, then you should be prepared um, for a, a multi-token um, Item number, for example. So once you um, get one identified. Yeah, once you know that iCred does it that way, then it works for everything. Yeah, that was great. Um, that was a situation where each one has to be individually. Right. Yeah. Charlotte has one. Go ahead. Um, have you got to the stage of working with JSTOR yet, or is that? We we've got we have a big dump of data from yeah. JSTOR, um, and I've done a few experiments, um, but I really I want to get I really want to get um, a better handle on the citation parsing and get more functionality um, in this as well. So I'd like to bring search online um, pretty quickly, for example, um, and. You know, I think I think having a better handle on managing the citations will give me the tools I need to work with JSTOR. Um, is the model going to feed this back into JSTOR? Is is it JSTOR going to produce wonderful it, dynamic links, or is this just they they would have the um, we they would they would be able to get the data they would need from us in order to do oh. that. Um, so. Um, yeah, ideally, to be able to do exactly the kinds of things they do with regular bibliography, mm -hmm. right? And it's very nice to be able to follow, just follow those links. Um, 
And if we can get this working, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do that for epigraphic citations as well.